Okay, welcome everyone to this episode of Breaking Absolutes. I'm thrilled today to have a conversation uh, with Daryl Pesh, who has um, really been a fixture in the metal scene for a very long time, doing it at a very high level. Um, as a reminder, our goal here is, this is not a, a typical radio style show, our goal is to talk to artists who we feel are doing really important work in the music. And by that, I don't mean to make it high-minded. It, the point is, um, these are artists who are uh, creating music that um, we believe deserves a broader audience. They're doing interesting things. They're pushing themselves. They're important to, to rock and metal culture. And we hope to bring them, them and their music to more listeners. Um, and so Dora fits this idea perfectly. Let me tell you a little bit about her before we bring her on, just for those who, uh, if, even if you know her, may not be as aware of how full and celebrated her career is. Um, she's at least, she'll keep me honest when we bring her on, but at least 17 studio albums. Um, she began fronting the, the metal band Warlock. We'll talk to her a little bit about that. Um, that group began to get some success, several records there before she started to... Um, record and perform under her own name. Um, the, there's, there's a very, very important, um, I think, note to her career, which is that uh, she really forged the way for females in metal singing um, and has done this in a way that was professional as, as well as entertaining. And as a consequence of her work there, there is a, a litany of... Um, uh, female vocalists who've come to the fore uh, and she's performed with some of them in duets and such but I think it's really important um, note to her career that in addition to the music she's served as a role model um, and a very very strong one um, not as a sort of a gimmick or uh, leaning in on on typical sort of promotional things that a record label might do and we'll talk to her a little bit about that but she's toured with the most important act metal acts of all time bands like Dio and Judas Priest and Megadeth um, she was the first one to, to do a drive-in concert during COVID, during COVID, which I think suggests a very forward-thinking um, woman in terms of bringing her art to people. She's very devoted to fans. She's made life decisions, thinking first about her music and her fandom, which I think is really remarkable. Um, she's been uh, nominated for five times for the German Echo Award, uh, 1994 Best National Female Artist, 13 times Best International Singer uh, by the uh, readers of Heavy Rock Magazine in Spain. Um, Flor Jansen, uh, Jansen, excuse me, who we've had on this program, said it was a huge honor um, uh, to, to uh, sing with her because she was a pioneer of female fronted, in the female-fronted scene. Um, so she has, Dora has the regard of her peers. Um, and... I mean, gosh, I could go on and on, um, but some of these things are things we want to ask her about. But I think you get my point. Um, the music is has mattered. The music has made an impact. So with that as my preamble, let me bring Doro on. Doro, welcome. Hey, welcome. Oh, man, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for this kind words that is so <laughs> nice and makes me feel so good and yeah and it's all true i guess you know what it you is. said i've yeah. doing it for such a long time and yeah and it's now 20 records and 20 happened. records yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you know it's um it's true and and i think what's remarkable about the kind of statistics and uh, awards that i mentioned is uh it's it's a a career that has, I think, just continued to get stronger. Um, and that's not always the case. Sometimes uh, bands erupt onto the scene with a great single or a great record, and there isn't a lot, a lot of follow-up. Um, but your record, I mean, your career has taken some turns in that you've uh, experimented with some different things. But I think, arguably, you, you, you command a larger audience and following now than you ever have. I think it's remarkable. Oh, yeah, oh, Peter, thank you so much. Yeah, because uh, when I started in the 80s, it was impossible, for example, to go and play uh, China or Russia. So, you know, now we have many, many more countries we can tour at and and everywhere there are metalheads. And that is so great. And even in Thailand, and I was one time doing a tour in Australia and then we stopped over in Thailand. And I tell you, the metal scene there was 
crazy. It was unbelievable. And I didn't even know. I didn't expect it. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing it for yeah almost 40 years. And I'm doing it full force every day. Every day, like, you know, giving it 110%. And, um, and, and when I was, like, about three years old, I made up my mind. I want to become a singer and I want to dedicate my life to music. And yeah, and then I started my first band when I was 15, 16. I had um, a few bands before Warlock. It was Snake Bite, Beast, Attack, and then Warlock. And then I guess we were at the right time in the right place. And then everything started. And it was just the beginning in Germany. I'm yeah from Germany. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and in Germany, it was a very small metal scene in the 80s. But then then it became huge and yeah. so in the beginning we toured actually more in other countries in england netherlands belgium and then we got our first record deal in belgium it was a tiny label it was called mausoleum and then first record came out and we were totally shocked and surprised that it did like you know, so good and that people even knew about our little band. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then a few years later, we toured with the yeah, Judas Priest. That was my first big tour. And it was unbelievable because I was a big Priest fan. And then, you know, when I heard we would be on tour with Priest, then I quit my job. I was a graphic artist before. And then we toured with Wasp in England and then with the legendary Ronnie James Dio. And then we took it from there and, you know, and toured with many other great people like Lemmy and Motorhead and Saxon, Megadeth and um, the Scorpions, ach, almost everybody. And um, yeah, and... Yeah, and I did it now every day. I never took a vacation. It's every day. Something is like, you know, like associated with music, either rehearsal or playing or or recording or writing a song. So, yeah, yeah I never took a break. And, uh, and, and time is flying, I tell you. I still remember when I was like 16 with my first band. It feels like maybe a few years ago. <laughs> well, you have a... <laughs> <clears throat> you have an inexhaustible energy. Uh, I watched some uh, other interviews with you in preparation for our conversation. I've seen uh, performance clips, um, you know, of you doing live shows, and you just you all you have to seem to have this well of of energy that is just inexhaustible. You, you I mean, you, you're such a work ethic, but also always seemingly so cheerful. Uh, is this just you know? Is this something that you were even as a kid? Just this exuberant? Uh, uh, I don't know, Peter. It, it depends uh, what kind of subject you want to talk about. Like when I want to talk about like music or the fans. Oh, man, then I'm on fire. Uh, Anything else what maybe normal people would talk about. You know, I'm not like, you know, I, I don't know much about it. Like even my closest friends, we don't have a deep connection because... When music is missing, then, you know, there's like nothing for me. Like, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm totally dedicated to the metalheads, to the fans and to the music. And then I'm totally on fire. You yeah. can wake me up, you know, five o'clock in the morning. You know, I can hop on stage when I see, you know, there's, you know, some, we are, I'm ready to rock anytime. And, but it just, it is, yeah, because of, yeah, the magic of music, everything else, like, yeah, I, I I like other things, but music and the fans, that's like, that's my passion. So that's why I can like, you know, like, yeah, yeah have a lot of more energy and, you know, and, and I, I love people. I love people. And, you know, and when I can make people happy, then I, I'm, I'm happy, you know, it like, it makes me feel good. And, um, and I was uh, growing up in a truck, uh, even as a baby, my dad, he was a truck driver. And so I really learned the hard way that you have to be, you know, disciplined and that you have to work hard. And that actually helped me a lot because when I had my first dance, then I could drive everybody home. I was going to work. I was, you know, hopping on stage. It was like 24 hours, like, you know, no sleep the first couple of years. And um, yeah, and I, I was I was glad that, you know, I, I learned about it at, at an early age and, um, you know, and to never like, you know, give up or to you know just like sit on the couch and stuff so I always like to do something and especially when times are not so good like last year with the COVID that was tough so 
So I tried out all kinds of things to keep it going, to keep the band going, to keep the contact with the fans. And that's how we did like our first drive-in shows, Autopino shows, or this year yeah. we did some beach chair shows. And it was hard work, man, I tell you. It was hard. It was 10 times harder than doing a normal show where everybody's right there, which I'm so, you know, I, I love when people, when I can smell their sweat, you know, when they're sweating in my face, like when they're head banging. And, you know, usually we sang in one microphone, which I guess these times are totally over. I'm, I'm sad about it, but I guess that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll probably not go back to normal ever, I think. But, um, when you had like this auto kino or drive-in show or beach chair concert, people were so far away. So you had to really think of something to, you know, to get them excited. And, you know, and then yeah. in the end, you know, I think everybody had just such a great time. And I was so glad that we could do it. And, and it's always good practice, you know. And sometimes when it's getting harder, then, you know, you learn a lot from different situations. You know, you have to stretch a little bit. And I think it's good. It's good for you. Yeah, and you've you've done that in your career. So that, and let's, so let's jump into the um, some of the specifics with um, some of the records. Um, what, a couple of quick questions though before we do that. Actually, you um, when you were very young, you actually um, had to overcome a bout of tuberculosis. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was lung tuberculosis, and I, I almost died for one year. I wasn't sure if I would survive, and. Uh, and then actually I really started praying and I thought, dear God, if I ever get out here alive, I will, I will do something with my life and I will make other people happy. And then I got out of the hospital after one year and two weeks later I had my first band. And that oh, band wow. was really and I, I don't I cannot even tell you how it happened. Somehow it it, it happened. It all fell into place and uh yeah, and um, and we didn't even know that it was metal. We just did what we felt. It was always powerful, energetic, you know, like uh, soulful, but aggressive, and you know, the whole spectrum of human nature. And yeah, and then I was in other bands, in other bands, and then we, when we started Warlock in '82, then we really could feel, mm, you know, it's uh, the combination of people, the songs, everything was like, you know, felt really good, and yeah, and then. But we just did music because we loved it. We never thought, you know, like of a big career. It was just, we had so much fun. And we were rehearsing every day, every day. And, and we had heavy rules. If somebody would uh, be late, you know, you would have to pay $50. And I was like, unbelievable you know and I was always late because I was working <laughs> I was the only one who was working and you know and um, yeah it was tough I, and, and I don't even know why we had to practice every day but we did but looking back at it I think it's it's good to always do something you know yeah. like every day there's something to be said and yeah for sure and it, so it's 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 remarkable that coming off that illness uh, and beating the illness and then launching into something with such energy. I, I, I mean, maybe it kind of stands to reason that the, even the idea of a band having rules like that, I, it suggests to me real commitment. Um, and you, and you, and, and, and the, the music that you create is, is so energetic. It's, it's kind of, um, fun to see when you watch uh, your live shows and you see the fans the, the fans are, um, they're just filled with a kind of joy. Um, and I think that you communicate that both in your stage presence, but also in the music that you write. And it's, I think it's part of your success. I mean, the, everything we're seeing in, in you right now, this just like this, um, this energy and this cheerfulness is what you communicate with your music and with your performances. And I think, I think people, there's, there are other kinds of metal that serve other kinds of emotional um interests but i love that your music just has is so joyfully exuberant i really do oh that's that that makes me so happy that makes me so happy yeah i think from day one i felt like the fans and our band and me we are one we are allies and it, there was always a deep connection and i don't even know i cannot even explain why but it is there and then uh, in the beginning of course you know it was like 
diehard metal and I was writing pretty, you know, like dark, mystical lyrics. But uh, many years later, I thought, man, you know, the world is in so, you know, like, like bad shape. I want to definitely give out more positive energy. And it's quite difficult because it's much easier to, to write like a destructive song, you know. For example, I was a big fan of Metallica. I still am. And I always love Kill Em All, you know. Oh, that's great. But, you know, to have something positive, which still is like, you know, like not, you know, not cheesy, not commercial, yeah. which still is metal, that is very difficult. But then I thought, man, I want to try and I want to give out, you know, power and hope and, you know, and, um, and then... By accident, the song came out, All We Are, which we had on our Triumph and Agony album that came out in 87, the original. And, you know, it was such a unifying lyric. And, you know, and, and yeah, and when I sing it live, everybody feels like, wow, you know, like so empowered and, you know, and happy to sing along. And the best thing is when people have 10 beers, you know, and then they scream and, you know, they don't <laughs> even sing the right lyrics and, you know, it's not like, you know, not in tune, but it sounds great to me. I love it. And and then I know everybody can go home, you know, totally happy and relaxed and, you know, and, and um, so that was actually by accident that something so powerful and positive was like one of our first big singles that was definitely that was the one that was the one yeah yeah oh it's it in some ways to me it's not surprising um because i think it's part of your nature and so i think that song was always going to come to the forefront and and move people um yeah yeah i think you're, you're right it's it's dead on and um and that was the first time that i felt totally free uh we did uh three records burning the witches was the first one hellbound the second one true steel the third one and then i could go to america for a little promotion tour uh three days and after two days i knew i wanted to stay i loved america and i was in new york and i thought i, I gotta stay i gotta stay and then and then everything you know was like you know like I, I met great people i had a new manager his name was alex grobe and he was from switzerland so he could talk German and he was an American citizen so that was perfect and he was a psychologist so that's great for the band for me for the road crew and uh, yeah and he introduced me to other great people Joey Ballon he was the producer of the Triumph and Agony album and we were just hanging out you know he showed me all kinds of record stores which were open 24 hours oh man I was in heaven it was <laughs> unbelievable and we went uh, you know to see all the clubs and then then we did a little jam session and and there we really thought, wow, you know, we have great chemistry and everything started to really fall into place. And, and then we went into a studio. It was the power station studio, the best studio at that time. And, uh, and then we had a couple of songs and, you know, we could feel this could be a really good record. And I totally felt supported and free before on, our third album, I felt so much pressure. The record company was putting so much pressure on the band, like to have uh, like a big hit, to make it more commercial, to make it radio friendly. And for a metal band, that word radio friendly is so like, you know, oh, we didn't like that at all. It's so triumph and agony. I felt really free. And when I was doing something, singing something, you know, screaming or, or singing something really different, everybody said, yeah, go for it, do it. And I said, really? Are you sure? Yes, you know, just go full out. And I thought, oh man, that's great. So, so you know, yeah, yeah, like freedom for a musician, that's the best, you know. I think the best can come out when you feel free and when you're just yourself. And um, yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. There, uh, there are plenty of examples of r metal bands, uh, even rock bands, um, who get pressure from the label. And it's yeah. very rare when that sort of oversight helps generate good music. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I even had to take the consequences that I don't want to do certain things. Like there was one record which I love so much uh, that it's called Love Me in Black. And the title track is Love Me in Black. It's a great song. Many people love it. And uh, then somebody had this idea. They said, well, Doro, you have to totally change your style, you know, and when you want to name it Love Me in Black, then cut off all your hair and dye it black. 
And I said, <laughs> what? Are you fucking crazy? And I said, no, I will not do it. I will not do it. And I said, yeah, it needs to be more commercial and a new image. And I thought, no, no, a metalheads, they don't like a new image. It's not like the pop culture where it's yeah. uh, essential to always look different or, you know, have different fancy clothes on or a new haircut. So, um, and then, yeah, in the end, you know, they thought, okay, we can release this record. And I thought, oh man, I worked three years on it. There was so much love and heart and soul in it. But after three years, yeah, I, I had to live with it. They didn't um, release it. And it was a very difficult time. It was like grunge was still big. So, you know, uh, it was, yeah, I definitely had like ups and downs. Like, you know, the whole career never went up. It, it was always like up and down and up and down. And then, you know, and I thought, okay, I, you know, I will make the best out of every situation you know if you know if if the time and people record company everybody supports you great if not then i just do what i love and there were still enough fans there to uh you know to yeah to to fill the clubs you know at least weren't many stadiums anymore but you know the sweaty nice dirty clubs oh i love just as much so so we could we could survive and yeah yeah, yeah that's uh I, I hate to hear those stories about uh, record labels that that do that to artists but you did survive it um i have one one other quick uh and then I've, i want to get into some specifics on your on the albums but you are you i read that you're a trained kickboxer uh, actually i trained i started uh, started? I started doing thai boxing okay. i loved it thai boxing and then um it was actually in a time it was a 95 when yeah, when touring was not so, you know, not not so big anymore because, you know, of grunge, our, you know, gigs and festivals, it was pretty limited. And then I thought I got to do something, you know, to still, you know, stay strong. And then I started uh, Thai boxing and uh, and then I started uh, Bing Chun. And, uh, and then I told my trainer, I would love to have something in my hands. And he said, well, you know, uh, I, he said, just for you, let's do Eskrima. It's like Eskrima is something like, you know, you can do it with knives or like with bamboo sticks. And yeah, and I, I love doing it. But now in the COVID times, it was impossible to train yeah. with other people. At first, I started doing it by myself. I went into the woods, you know, and everybody thought, oh, this is, you know, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Kill a woman. But, uh, yeah, but but now, you know, we're, yeah, we're starting to play life again. So so I'm not doing it at the moment, but I love martial arts. Oh, yeah, I'm a yeah. big sucker for it. And, yeah, all that's kinds cool. of tough sports I love. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool, that's a cool uh side side life for you um let's talk i wanted to ask you we have a lot of musicians that follow the channel uh and i have a lot of vocalists on so i'm always and i'm a trained vocalist myself so i, I have a particular um, affinity for vocalists and so i'm i'm interested with your vocal development is is uh how you came into your sound and your the way you use your voice something that you just um arrived at by by practice and rehearsal and performance or did you do any sort of training to build your voice into what it is today oh you know, I, t I tell you this funny story i don't know if you heard it you know from other interviews but i just started i always had like you know i could always sing very loud i know that you know and uh and like and scream you know and um and and i can always sing like 20 hours straight the voice never will give up so um when i started having my first bands then you know i was just doing what i felt and you know and i guess naturally it came out pretty good pretty powerful and um and then when we did our first or second record i did a couple of interviews and then many journalists they were asking me hey where did you learn it and are you a trained singer and did you go to university and i thought no man i'm just singing what i feel <laughs> and uh after a while, I thought, man, you know, that really, it, it got on my nerves that everybody was asking me and I wasn't a trained singer. So I took vocal lessons and it was sinfully expensive. <laughs> I took them for one, two years. And then after a little while, people were saying, hey, Doro, hey, what are you doing? You do something different. And I said, yeah, but, you know, 
I didn't, I didn't know what they were, you know, talking about. And then many more people said, hey, Doro, you sounded much better before. What are you doing? And I said, I'm taking vocal lessons here <laughs> to really learn how to sing. And they said, that totally sucks. I can't you sing like you sang before. And I thought, wow, man, now I blew all that money, like time, you know, like two years. like. And then I thought, okay, you know, screw it. And then I gave up my vocal lessons. So I could tell you, yes, I took vocal lessons. I became a trained singer, but to me, it didn't, it didn't do anything. It didn't help. It just, I think it just was the opposite because yeah. it didn't sound natural. And the people I think they like the most when I, when I'm, you know, myself and when I just belt it out and just like, yeah, and sing, sing from my heart and soul and gut. And I think for rock and metal, I think that's the most important thing. For classical music, of course, I guess you have to be trained. And, yeah. But I think for rock and metal, I just go for it. Like, you know, do it like Bon Scott, you know, or Lemmy, just, you know. And uh, yeah. yeah, but that's that's that was my vocal training. But it didn't didn't do me any good, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, you know, I just hop on stage. I don't even warm up. I just do it. And, you just do it. Know. It's funny. I, uh, it, the conversations I've had vary a lot. But I'm finding many of the singers have not done any sort of training. They just uh, work. They just use their own voice and fi they find what works for their own voice. Um, yeah. So yeah, it yeah. doesn't surprise me that um, that that's how you've cultivated this sound that's so distinctive for you. And it has this kind of power to it. This grit. Um, you know that, that. Of course, that's a that's a familiar technique in in rock music. Um, but you were doing that as a as a female front woman before most were even in front of a band. I mean, so you you blazed a trail not just in I think being a, a, a professional successful female metal singer, but also in the sound that you brought to it. Um, uh, so I, I'm sorry. Thanks for indulging me uh, with the the story because I I love to hear about vocalist backstory. Um, Let's talk about some of the uh, some of the albums then. So um, the your first is it four albums were with Warlock or did you do release five with Warlock? Uh, no, four. Burning the Witches, Hellbound, True Steel, and Triumph and Agony, and then the fifth album that was supposed to be the Force Majeure, and we were working on it. It was the follow up of Triumph and Agony, which was really successful, and we are just you know putting out a live album of Triumph and Agony to celebrate 35 years of Triumph and Agony. But anyhow, it was the follow-up. And then um, I had like two managers, one in Germany, he was doing all the European stuff and one in America. And um, when we uh, got uh, Triumph and Agony released, then in Europe, we hopped on tour with the beloved legendary Ronnie James Dio and it was like awesome man it was so it was so great and yeah and then one time my American manager he said well I gotta talk to you and I said okay what is it I, I hate when people say I gotta talk to you yeah. and I already like oh you know felt sick to my stomach and I said okay what is it he said well the European manager left and I thought left and I, 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 I couldn't understand because it was just, we were just on the verge to become a little bit successful. Everything was going well, you know, great tour. It was like, you know, the MTV was playing the videos in and out. It was unbelievable. And the time was so great. 87 when yeah. metal was so big. So the German guy left and uh, we never talked about it. And he left to, uh, he went to Turkey. And back then you couldn't find anybody in Turkey. There was no internet, no cell phone. He just left. We never talked about it. And I was really sad because I liked him a lot. He was a great friend of ours, but he was the merchandiser as well. And, uh, and while we were on tour, our parents, they got some phone calls from some fans who were helping the manager packing all the t-shirts and many, many more people, they, they said, hey, there's something going on. There's something fishy going on. We should check into it. But when you're on tour, you know, as a musician, you just care, you know, about the concert, the fans. And I thought, wow, man, I mean, what do I know? You know, I, I said, I have to, I have to put on a great show. And, and then, and 
the business end was always like not important to me anyhow. So I thought it will be all okay. But when the guy left a little while later, he claimed that he has the rights to the name Warlock mm. because he wanted to sell these T-shirts, you know, which were like, you know, it was uh, it was a lot of money in in it in the eighties. Oh my god! And um, and then we thought, okay, we will go to court. We will sort it out. And uh, that was my first time that I was in court and I started yelling and screaming and then they removed me. And I thought, I, I can't believe it because, you know, um, you know, I, I was so upset and I, I couldn't believe that the manager would claim it's his name. And he came there in a white suit. You know, he looked all like, you know, like uh, he looked all very conservative and and our guys in the band, we all looked like metalheads. And the judge, he was pretty conservative too. And so he could use the name and we couldn't use the name anymore. And that was the reason why the next record after the Triumph and Agony album was uh, called Doro. I never yeah. planned on doing a solo career ever. I, I, I it never even crossed my mind. And yeah, and then I thought, okay, let's do it one time. And then the next time, like two years later, we will use Warlock again because we will get uh, the name back. But it took 20 years. And now I had to wait 20 years to get the rights to the name Warlock back. And I tell you, that was a long time. Yeah. 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 And that, it, it is strange to me because my notes show that that, that Triumph and Agony record, it went gold it hit, and it hit the Billboard ah. charts in the U.S. So it seems a, a strange time to remove yourself from what was a, gr a growing successful group yes yeah i guess you know i must say in the 80s and 90s um you know business was like it was really music business and you know it was big and you know the big record companies there was there was so much money in it so i think the guy which we always thought he's cool he's our friend i really liked him a lot i think it got to him. I think, you know, he got in touch with other people who were like a little bit shady, you know, and um, yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, it, uh, it, it ruined him and it ruined us too. But uh, yeah, like, I guess money is a strange thing. And, uh, and since, you know, I, I was never interested in it. I was only interested in the music and the fans going on tour, doing a great record. But uh, when other people suddenly, you know, smell a little bit of success, then, you know, maybe, you know, I think he, he yeah. went crazy. But, but he's not, not alive anymore. He got killed, I heard. I heard uh -oh. from a guy in a magazine. He called me up and he said, hey, you know that your former manager got killed in Turkey? And I said, really? And I said, oh, okay, I, I wonder why, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you but, have to uh, wonder. I don't know if it's true, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, but I know, I know he's not anymore with us, and yeah, and I, I feel kind of I feel kind of bad that we never talked about it, and you know, I always like to resolve things, but you know, but that was tough. Like, oh man, oh, and I love the name Warlock and everything about it, and you know, and and the witch, like the male witch, that was such a symbol. I think you know, it was you know almost as nice as the eddy of iron maiden so that was our thing and you know and it was real metal so um yeah yeah but i tried to find a way to continue and well you did i, I you know it's uh, and you've built such equity in um just to use kind of a business term in doro as a brand you know you know when you hear that what you're going to get um you're going to get quality music you're going to get uh, a, a world-class uh tour stage performance um so that i mean that and and i think people knew like you were the linchpin you were the linchpin I, obviously it, everybody's important but the thing that sort of drove things forward was you before and after the change um i wanted to ask you in not too long after you began um under the doro moniker you did a record that is self-titled where you had gene simmons produce yeah oh man yeah oh, how did God. did you just have his number like <laughs> how did you got, get in touch with gene simmons to do this <laughs> yeah actually um i was a big kiss fan growing up and you know i i still am and um uh, and one time i got a phone call i was in la doing something and a promoter of the monsters of rock festival called me and he said doro kiss is playing would you like to introduce kiss on stage 
And I thought, oh, yes, you know. And uh, so I flew back to, it was in Germany. Actually, I, I played Monsters of Rock in 86. That was our biggest festival. And, you know, and it was a door opener. We did one in England, Castle Donington, and two in Germany. And then everything else fell into place. Then the Judas Priest tour, and I could go to America, the first American record release. And so I knew Monsters of Rock, that was something really important. So I said, yes, you know. So I went uh, to, I flew back to Germany. And then I uh, I was talking to the promoter and he told me what I should say, you know, and I was I was nervous because, you know, meeting my heroes and and then I was in this catering tent. It was quite dark and then I was talking and talking and then I heard somebody singing, oh, we yeah. are like. And then I turned around, you know, and like, oh, we are. And I, and I didn't see anybody. And then I was talking again. And then again, oh, we are. And and then Gene Simmons came out of the stand, <laughs> you know. And, and you know, he said, hi, I'm Gene Simmons. And I was like, wow, you know. I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm honored to introduce you guys tonight. And, you know, I'm a big Kiss fan and, and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, and then I introduced them. And I watched uh, the show and I, it was awesome. It was awesome. So a couple of months later or one year later, I talked to my manager. I was living in Manhattan and uh, my manager, his name was Alex. And I said, Alex, you know what? My dad and Gene Simmons, they almost have uh, on the same day. It's the same uh, day, the birthday. I would like to write Gene Simmons a birthday card. And, and my manager said, are you crazy? I mean, you know, he has no time for that. And then I said, yeah, I was just thinking to be nice and stuff or maybe doing something together. Maybe we could do a song together or maybe I could cover a kiss song. And Alex said, just drop it, drop it. You know, that's a, that's a childish idea, just, you know. And I said, okay, okay. So a couple of weeks later, my phone rang early in the morning and usually I go, to bed early in the morning so it was very you know odd that the phone was ringing and Alex was on the phone he said get out of bed you know meet me at the Parker Meridian Hotel it's like 57th 58th street in Manhattan right now and I said right now I said why he said well there's a surprise and I said oh, okay what is it he said no I can't tell you you know you just gotta get up and you know get here okay so i didn't take a shower i didn't put on my makeup and you know how girls are you know you need a little color especially early in the morning so i went to the hotel and then alex was uh, waiting for me in front of the hotel and i said okay alex now tell me who is it and i thought maybe some german friends or fans or family or whatever and he said gene simmons i said what are you crazy you didn't tell me gene simmons is waiting there for me he said yes yes you have a meeting with gene simmons and you guys can talk about your next album and i thought oh my god and i had to walk three times around the block because i was so nervous my knees were shaking and then after three times alex said okay now you gotta be ready and we walked in and gene simmons was sitting there it was in the hotel lobby and he said, hey, Dora, I, I heard you are working on a new album or you're thinking about it. And I said, yeah. And then he said, well, what, what do you want to do? What kind of ideas? What kind of sound? And he wrote everything down. And I was not used to having anybody like really listening. Usually people listen a little bit and I said, yeah, yeah you know, let her talk. And he was writing down every single word and taking like taking a really serious and I thought wow man that, that's unbelievable so he said you know what Dora, we, we can try you know we can try it out and if nothing comes out and you know we just had a good time nobody will know about it and then we tried it out and we started in New York and then we recorded uh, the whole record in LA in the Fortress studio there was the studio where Kiss uh, recorded Hut in the Shade with a great engineer, Pat Reagan was his name. And Tommy Thayer, he was the co-producer and he played many guitar licks and solos. And yeah, and so we That's recorded cool. and, and produced the whole record and wrote many songs on it. And I did one cover version of Kiss, It Was Only You. It's a song of the Elder album. I loved it so much. And and you wrote many great songs, something wicked this way comes. And oh, you know, I was in heaven for one year, I was in heaven. And, <laughs> But I could never get over it. Like, you know, every day I went to the studio, 
I was like, my heart was racing. I was like, oh man, I can't, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. It's like, it's different, you know, when you see your idol and, you know, yeah. even, you know, yeah. and you always have this childlike thing. Like, you know, when I was 10, 11, I was a big Kiss fan. And when I was in the studio, I felt I was 10, 11. And, you know, <laughs> it was like, it was great. But yeah, he was very kind, very nice, very caring. And, yeah, that's. And a, I learned a lot from Gene. <laughs> that's a very cool moment in your career, for sure. Um, there's some other really uh, cool notes I want to make um, here. We don't have to talk about everything because we've got a lot to get to, and I want to respect your time. But as an example, with the "Angels Never Die" record, um, you the "Bad Blood" song was voted best anti-racism video by the MTV European Music Awards. Um, and I find like these these sparklers exist throughout your career. They, they, these moments of of, um, of recognition for for work you've done, um, they just keep keep accruing to uh, you know to your success in the industry. Um, you headlined uh, Vakken in 1993, um, which like all by itself is is amazing for any group. Um, oh, we, we had like I think five six times. I know, I know. Year, yeah, yeah. But wasn't but that the first one? Bio, it was like it was the first time, and oh god, and and and, and ever th- since I was there, almost every year. Like, and then you you since um, written anthems for the festival. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. Many times. Yeah. yeah. Totally, totally. I, yeah, I, I love writing anthems. Uh, ever, I guess, since Oh We Are, I love anthems. And I uh, I wrote many anthems for Wacken, for other festivals. There was one festival, it was the Female Metal Voices Festival. Yeah. And that song was called Strong and Proud. And, uh, and I have a great friend. She was a 13 years boxing champion. Her name is Regina Halmisch. And she's, she's a great tough girl and uh one time we met and you know and she said hey doll could you could you write an anthem for me to walk in and i thought oh yes so i wrote five anthems for her and she always won and i was so glad because i always felt like oh man if she's not winning i am responsible you know because (laughs) i didn't set the atmosphere right but she was always winning and we're still great friends and uh she's she's a power woman and uh, yeah, I, was gonna, I love her so much i was gonna ask you about that so i'm glad you told us the story the um, one interesting sideline um you also do have done a little bit of acting um because i yeah, have a note yeah. here for for a soap <laughs> opera in 1995 <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was that was the soap opera, but I did uh, three movies, yeah. actually four movies, and there were real movies. Uh, the soap opera it was just it was it, it was a funny thing. But the movies, uh, the guy he is a uh, great like a free spirit, crazy, but you know like very creative. His name is uh, Luke Gasser, and he asked me one time if I want to. Uh, write some music for his movie it was called Anuk the Path of the Warrior and Anna said oh I would love it and uh, and then we were like actually we kind of like uh, immediately hit it off and you know became friends and then he said Doro would you like to act in my movie as well and he said you can pick uh, the character you want to play and there was one girl her name is Meha and she's a real warrior and you know and I said look I would like to play the part of Meha and he said yeah that's the main you know character let's do it and then we did uh, three movies that's awesome and um, yeah and we wrote all the music and the music score and the title tracks and that was awesome that was great and um it's like yeah and i felt even like that character i learned so much from that character it was great and and there were many fighting scenes and i had to um i had to learn how to how to do certain things it was great and yeah. uh yeah, and he produced one of my records as well. That was Warrior Soul because we had great songs, but somehow, I don't know, sometimes, you know, you start somewhere and then maybe you can't finish it in a good way. And then he said, hey, Doro, you know, you know what? Just take all your songs. We redo everything. And we did, and it came out wonderful. And that's uh, the Warrior that's, Soul album. <laughs> that's that's cool. Is the is the fourth film that you're talking about the soaring highs and brutal lows? 
the voices of women in metal, or is it a different fourth film? Oh, I think that's a different film. Okay. Oh, God, there were so many films. Yeah, I, I tell you, yeah, I sometimes, yeah, there, there's so many movies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just like, yeah. yeah that's a cool, uh, that's yeah. a cool. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another one. Yeah, yeah, but that was actually more a documentary. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, well, I think it's really cool. It shows some diversity in your, um, in your artistic life. But there was a, there were, uh, I, I read some notes that talked about a time a difficult time. I think it was in the '90s, and you you said you were even doing some some pickup jobs, do, you know, doing weddings and private parties, just to kind of get th through. Oh, really? oh, 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 Peter! I think I never did did that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe oh. somebody wrote it, but I think I never did. Okay, we need to we need to <laughs> fix your um some of your bio, uh, bio stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, even sometimes in Wikipedia, they, you know, sometimes people write crazy, crazy things. Stuff. And, yeah. Yeah, but it's not true. I was never married and I don't have kids. And, <laughs> and, and you know, like, it's like, uh, yeah, no, I, I never, I sang uh, for Emma at some people's weddings, like uh, the first German song we did for the Triumph and Agony album, I did, you know, but just for friends or yeah. like in Wacken or biker weddings but uh but in the 90s no i, I never picked up another job than, than, than you, doing what i'm doing now you you said that uh, early on you were able to sort of stop doing the graphic design so that even though that's a maybe an interest that's not something you still do yeah i i i still love like you know doing the whole album cover or the logos and i worked close with the guy who's painting everything oh, good. or our graphic artist yeah i still love doing it i love the visual stuff i think it's all one like the music and you know the usually i, I still love vinyl like you know the album cover sure. and you know yeah. the booklet um yeah, yeah, I'm, we're always doing it together. Yeah, that's a. I mean, you know, that's a very complimentary skill because your your album covers are always very evocative. You do a good job with those for yeah. sure. Thank uh, you, thank you. We have a great painter too. I'm not painting myself. Uh, the guy, his name is Jeffrey Gillespie, and oh, he's awesome. And, and and he did the first time that was that that, that one. That's like that 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 yeah. iconic thing. That's the original Triumph. And it's not a record. It's like a it's an acrylic mat for your record player but that was the first time he did our album cover and ever since you know i i love his work and uh, and and this new triumph and agony live album we did actually the combination and um, i might have it handy here so yeah let's see it more, let's see. That's oh the that's... album cover for the triumph and agony live and it's between like you know um, the live photos and of course this kind of iconic thing yeah and it's the biggest album cover in the world again we had one time in 87 it was in the guinness book of world records was the biggest one oh, and wow. now we did it twice as big and there's a marbled vinyl in the back so and you know all kinds of old school stuff i uh, uh, started my own label to do all kinds of like you know special things like yeah. special you know, special merchandise yeah. And yes, and like for the collectors and for the vinyl lovers, and there's even a cassette. And you know, oh wow, really? That's and, cool. Yeah, there's a cassette. That's like that's. And we have many box sets, so that's the cassette. And I think it's so cute. Yeah. I actually <laughs> bought a new record, uh, a new cassette player. Like last week, I bought a new one, and just for kicks, you know, just for yeah. And and there's another. There's the figurine. I show you that. Man, I showed you pretty much everything. Oh wow, you know, that's phenomenal. awesome! Yeah, like yeah, so cool. <laughs> yeah, Adrian Vandenberg. He always, you know, like we always, you know, like like check our Instagram, and then he said, "Is he me touring you?" <laughs> I said, "No, no, no, no chance, no chance." But back then, you know, nobody even thought about it, and you know, but what I thought it was it was pretty nice. And, yeah, yeah, and the wall of those, yes. Yeah, this evil, you know. Yeah, that's male witch. You know? And is are these? Um, we'll, we'll include a link. Where where are all of these things to be found? Is it just on your personal website? Ah, oh, oh, Peter, I guess you can buy it all over. It's coming out twenty fourth of September. So I guess you know every record store. I hope will have it. Or I mean Amazon. the. I, I mean the the special merchandise you were showing. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, it's all in the box set. It's like you know, their special box set. Oh, okay. And, like, you know, it's like special, oh, I see. special things. Like yeah, yeah, and uh, and the vinyl, they are like special box sets as well. And so yeah, so so like really old school. There's patches in it for your battle vest and stickers and buttons and but the figurine, you know, like. Since I love the Kiss figurines, I had to have my own have one figurine too. ones. So. <laughs> and the Warlock, you know, makes like, you know. It's well, the, the Metal Queen should have that. I mean, that's a moniker that you were given like 20 years ago or so. Uh, and that's, that's, it's one that's very uh, apropos, I think. I think you, you're a, a, the perfect exa uh, ambassador of, of the music. So. Yeah. Thank you. I, I know yes, thank you so much. And I like that you say 20 years ago. It's almost like, yeah, you know, when I told you, yeah, the original came out in 87. So we're celebrating 35th anniversary of Triumph and Agony soon. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. Um, so the, the new record is, is you, I, I saw this, but is the release date later this month? Yeah. 24th, 24th 24th of september and yeah and i can't wait and yeah and i didn't see the vinyl edition yet but uh somebody will give it to me tomorrow and then we are going to england to play another festival and yeah so yeah this will be good this will be good and yeah nothing can make me more happy than you know when you when you have your record in your hands and when everything you know worked out great when you're happy with it you know the cover the sound the songs oh that's that's for me like that's christmas and new year's eve and everything <laughs> all together you know and birthday and yeah that's like i live for that because i know it it, it will mean so much to to other people to the fans they will probably you know love it and and that that's like you know what i what i like the most you know when other people love it but i love it too like usually it goes vice versa when i'm on fire for something or a song or an idea or an album cover whatever then I can feel yes i can you know yeah I, I can let other people check it out and usually they feel the same and of course it has to be the same taste not everybody likes you know what we do or you know likes different kind of music but but like the diehard fans i i know i know what what, what like. i can offer them yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. well you know the um the enthusiasm with which you approach the music in your career uh, is contagious um for the fans for sure but also for you know other musicians you're you're very celebrated for um your collaborative efforts you do these duets um and there's oh my gosh there's a whole page so long i couldn't even read them all yeah. of how many duets you've done but you've worked with um even on uh, uh when you did your 25th 25th anniversary you had um guys like bobby ellsworth and um Klaus Mound and Ru Rudolf Schenker and uh, Tara Turner and, and Warl Dane. I mean, Lord Jansen, uh, uh, Jansen, it goes on and on. And this, this typifies like this, um, this mutual reciprocity that I've seen in your career where you're having artists guest with you on, on songs and um, in, in performance. And in turn, they're asking you to do the same. I think it's really like, it was this, it, did this, just kind of come up as an idea that you should start doing this where you asked how did this whole idea of collaboration come into your career oh yeah yeah i, I tell you like the first time i did a duet was like with, with lemmy and actually we did two songs on my calling the wild album and it came about because um yeah uh, one time I uh, I was uh, going through my record collection and then I saw the Motorhead album was vinyl and I, I took it out and I saw a photo of Lemmy and me in the Motorhead record and I thought, wow, and it was a picture. It was from 1986 when we did Monsters of Rock Festival in England, in Castle Donington and Motorhead played there as well. It was Ozzy Osbourne, Scorpions, Bon Jovi, Motorhead, Warlock and... Um, and in Germany was Michael Schenker, but England uh, was Motorhead. And I remember I was so nervous because we didn't even know there was such a huge festival. I thought maybe three, four, five thousand 5,000 people. So we went to the location and it was like 80,000 people there. And oh, that was yeah. the first time that we played this huge festival. 
And Lemmy saw me and Lemmy said, hey, are you nervous? And I said, oh, a little bit. He said, you don't have to. And then he gave me a little kiss on my on my head and, you know, and gave me a hug. And that's the picture. Somebody took a picture of that. And he said, okay, now knock him dead. And I went on stage and I felt like a million bucks. And I saw this picture in this uh, album uh, sleeve and you know I thought wow maybe I write a letter to Lemmy and uh, and it happened to be that we were label mates I just uh, was an artist on SPV records it was in 2000 and and uh, Motorhead was on SPV as well so I wrote a letter to the management I cut out the li a little photo and I put it in I said hey let me you know it's the German girl maybe you remember me and stuff and you know and then I said well I'm ready to do a new record. And if you are interested in doing something together, just like, you know, let me know. And, you know, and then, but all the best. And, you know, and I love you. I love your music and so on, so on. So I sent the letter to the management and I never expected that I would get an answer. I almost forgot about it. And I thought, well, but I was happy that I could, you know, like show my appreciation. And yeah, and then, and then it was tough times. Uh, I had a, a great dad. Um, uh, dad was a truck driver we were a great team and you know and he loved music so i guess you know i have it you know because of of him that that i love music so much too so my dad he was very very sick like super sick and it was uh, totally difficult and uh and one day he died and i was totally shocked even though he he was like ill but i never thought that he would die so i was totally devastated i thought man i i i'm gonna kill myself i can't take it and then the next day i went somewhere with my mom and we were in like the store and she had to you know buy something you know like like for the funeral and and then the phone rang and you know and it was pretty loud and my mom said hey pick up the phone and I said no I don't want to talk to anybody you know <laughs> I don't want to hear from anybody and she said please pick up the phone because she was embarrassed that everybody was looking at us so I checked my phone and it was an LA number and I thought oh okay and then I picked up the phone and it was Lemmy and let me say hey Doro I got your letter and let's do something together yes and I said Lemmy I'm so I'm so devastated my dad just passed away yesterday and i don't want to do anything anymore and you know i don't even know how to go on he said you gotta come here to la uh, the fly to la and we do something and i said i don't know he said well say yes yeah to make a long story short so uh, let me say on the phone hey doro please you know like fly to la and we do something and i said okay so a couple of weeks later i you know i did take the flight to la and, and then Lemmy came to my hotel room and he said, Dora, I have a song, you know, I would like you to, to listen to it. And he played me a song and it was called Alone Again. And he sang it and played it on the acoustic guitar. And I tell you, it moved me to tears. It was mm. so soulful, you know, it was like, wow, you know. And I thought, Lemmy, I love it. I would love to sing it. He said, really? And I said, yes. So that was our first duet. And, and then we had so much fun together and let me, he never wanted to sleep, never. When we stopped like in, you know, our studio, Bob Kulik, he produced it and he was in his studio and he's not anymore with us. He was a great, phenomenal guy, guitar player, unbelievable. But uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, we finished our session at four o'clock in the morning. And then I said, let me, shall I drive you home now? He said, no, no, I don't want to go home. He said, just drive. And then I said, where shall I drive? He said, just drive. So we were driving all night for two weeks. I never really like slept more than one hour. And then <laughs> sometimes we drove all night, went straight back into the studio. And, and we had a lot of fun, a lot of great, you know, talks. And oh, it was awesome. And yeah, and then we did another song that was Love Me Forever. I love this Motorhead song from the album 1916. And then, yeah, I had my first duets ever and it just and, and i didn't plan on that but ever since you know i thought man it's so much it, it is so much magic to work with other great people and you know and then i did so many duets and you know and and sometimes people were asking me if i want to sing on their song and album yeah. and i did and the last one was actually my duet with johan heck of amona mars 
and uh, we actually played in um, in Wacken, and I we played our show, and then I watched their show, and then I thought, wow, you know. And then I I told my tour manager, the guy who just called, I said, Hans, hey, I would love to do something with a mono math. He said, I I think that could be something really interesting. Yeah, and then a couple of months later, I didn't think about anything anymore, and then I got an email of the band Amon Amath and I said, hey, Doro, would you like to sing a duet with us? You know, we have this record in the making. There was a uh, young Viking. And I thought, oh, man, they obviously felt the same, you know, that we had good chemistry. Yeah, and then I sang on their album. And then I asked Johan if he would sing on my album. There was the last one, Forever Warriors, Forever United. And we did kind of like a really passionate, you know, dark love story. And uh, the song was in, on Yom's Viking, it was called A Dream That Cannot Be. And on my record, it was If I Can't Have You, No One Will. And uh, we wrote it all together. Johan and my guitar player, Tommy Bowen and me. And it's like, you know, it's like a kind of edgy, you know, yeah, love story. Like, you know, a little a little dark, you know, but, yeah. but cool. And very, you know, aggressive, like, you know. Well, and just... Just to punctuate that, um, a few uh, if, there's a there's a Wikipedia page that is literally de devoted just to your discography, that is just enormously long and includes a bunch of these. But just I want to give a few. Um, it it enumerates um, uh, features either on your record or on other artists uh, with Dio, Blaze Bailey, um, yeah. Lemmy, Twisted Sister, Ministry, After Forever, um, uh, Tara. Um, oh my gosh. Klaus Mein and Rudolf Schenker, uh, uh, Big City Nights, and uh, in, the, in your 25-year rock, still going strong. Warl Dane that we mentioned before. Um, Motorhead, of course. Uli John Roth. Angra, which is a favorite band of mine. Uh, I know. Yeah, I love, I love those guys. Um, I think Fabio Leone's got a, a, an amazing voice. But the, the this just kind of um, helps to show, like, this sort of mutual respect inside uh, inside the 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 ranks of of the musicians that I think is not only fun to do and great for the fans but I think it's a it's a it's a nod um uh of you know respect uh and so I, I like to share those I wanted to just make the quick mention if folks hadn't seen it some years ago Metal Hammer gave you the Golden God Legend Award which just is uh, another accolade that is suggestive of of you know the how meaningful your career has been. Um, and uh, the, the, I mean, the last thing I wanted to, to say, and then I've just got uh, two parting questions uh, is something I said up front, but I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful and powerful thing, Daryl, to um, be able to look at a career like yours um, and not even, not even invoke necessarily that you're a female artist. The, the, what you've done has mattered to, to metal uh, music fans and culture um the music you've contributed is you know it's, it's just filled with such a uh, a vibrance i think and it's so much fun to watch i i've never been to Vakken, but i'm, I'm gonna go someday and i look forward to seeing you on that stage yeah yeah, um, oh yeah. yeah you gotta you gotta go to Vakken. i gotta go yeah. to Vakken someday yeah. um yeah. but it's it's all of that is made just that much more impressive by the fact that you were you were blazing a trail that many other um, great, great female singers have followed, and they've they've noted that that you were a primary source of inspiration for them. So I think all of that speaks very highly of you. Um, uh, Thank you so much, Peter. That's that's too much. You know, I'm just <laughs> doing what I love. I know, know and so I know, beautiful. and I you are you are um, beautifully humbly about about it, and and focused in the right way. You're focused on the music and the thing that you love to do. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that a guy like me can observe and and say to people, and that's why I like to take the chance to do it. Um, that's good. And I just wanted to add, I I had the great chance to work with Udo Dirk Schneider and Pete Steele as well. Oh yeah, you know, Pete Steele. That was another like great duet, and on our album Fight, and the song was called Descent. And oh man, I love every every breath you know he was like wow you know it was so it was it was great it's a great song and you know it's like wow you know so so i just wanted to add yeah. it on like 
there were other great people, but uh, definitely Pete Steele that was uh, that one. was pretty outstanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he now, was the tallest man I've ever seen in my life. You oh, know? Yeah? oh my god, yeah, 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 yeah. But very sweet, oh, super, super nice, super kind, total gentleman, and you know, very, very soulful as well. Yeah. 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 Well, so after the the, give me the name of the record that's coming out on the twenty fourth again. Uh, yeah, that's Triumph and Agony Life. That's that one. That's that, that one. one. And yeah, and, and it has all the Triumph and Agony songs on it, but not in the same sequence because you can't start with All We Are. On the original, we started out with All We Are, and that was our biggest anthem. So you couldn't start the show with All We Are. It's like you can't go anywhere, you know, from, from there. there. So yeah. it's, uh, starting with Touch of Evil, and it's kind of mystical. And then, you know, it's like, you know, it's pretty pretty cool and then all oh, we ask the last take and you sing and, and you can you know hear everybody singing along and you know it's uh, i think it's great and there's a, a blu-ray as well oh nice you see the live uh, concert yeah. yeah and i think it's awesome and a documentary about the whole making of triumph and agony and bootleg videos i put everything in everything what i think is interesting for the oh that's really movies. cool yeah well um it sounds like that you've got some live dates lined up are you sort of touring later this month and then on into the holiday uh, yes, actually, uh, oh, I never, yeah, holiday doesn't, that doesn't matter to me. But uh, yeah, we go to England, uh, we headline festival in Sheffield, uh, rocking the ball. And then we do a couple of gigs in Austria. And then we hop on tour with Michael Schenker in England. And then we do a whole European tour in November. But I tell you, it's all like, we don't know if it will happen yeah. because numbers are going up and oh my God. And then, uh, and I just, um, yeah, the England thing is my last open air. I did many, many open air festivals and stuff now, but uh, indoors, it's a different story. So, so we'll see, but yeah. I'm hoping for the best. It would be France and Poland and Germany and Belgium and everything. But some of the clubs, I know they have no air conditioning, you know, no oxygen. So I don't know. And um, yeah, we're thinking about, we're talking to, each promoter and yeah but it's all lined up and actually and our last tour we postponed uh, you know to, to do it this year and then next year we will do stuff what we had planned like one and a half years ago so we don't know but america is definitely you know like uh, next year we will okay, you know, come back and i was gonna and ask about that. all the great festivals yes yeah you know i'm yeah when i went to america in 87 ever since you know i i love america and i'm a proud green card holder so <laughs> yeah yeah and one day i would like to become a citizen and yeah so touring america is always like oh man do you um I'm, heaven when you guys do the the american legs of the tour do you this is a selfish question but do you come through seattle at, at all uh I, I, yeah it was a while ago i think four years ago we we played in seattle and on our last tour it was 2019 we didn't go to seattle but it was our uh, tour with metal church and and you know and i'm, I'm so sad that my cow is not anymore with us because yeah. he was such great guy and it was such an awesome tour it was great all the fans who you know came to see the shows i think they would agree it was a great package it was a great show and and yeah towards the end of the tour mike and me we were always singing together like usually it was breaking the law oh nice we both love you know priest and yeah but I'm, I'm so sad i i couldn't believe it when when i heard that yeah that he's not anymore with us he was so sweet but I think sometimes the really sweet, sensitive people, man, they are like this, you know, it's, it's tough times. I, you know, yeah, and, you know, and I, I don't know exactly the background, but, but I'm super sad. And yeah, he was yeah. awesome. Man. Well, when you start to talk to American promoters, put, put um, just make a vote yeah, for Seattle. <laughs> Cause yes, I, I would love yes. to see you come through, through town and, and get a chance to yeah. see you live yeah um yeah we played great clubs in seattle i remember that there were great people there there were many uh, native american people there like you know and yeah and i i i forgot you know their names but i know exactly how they looked and yeah, yeah. cool people and i i hope they're 
they will watch, you know, this interview. And yeah, but yeah, definitely we want to come to Seattle, of course. Maybe a package tour or a club tour, you know, on yeah. our own. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll watch for that. Here's my here's my last question, Doro. It's um, I ask all of my my in all of my conversations, I ask this, and it is uh, it, clearly your focus and your passion is music. But is there yeah. some mount? I call it a mountain you want to climb. Something you want to do in your life that will wait till you have the time. It could be creative. It could be even music of a different sort, or it could be completely non-creative. But is there something you know you want to do? and try and achieve, you know, when the, when time permits. Is there anything like that in your back of your head? Oh, Peter, that's a short answer. No, <laughs> I, not really, not really. I love, like, you know, I, um, I would love, you know, when time would go back to normal, that would be awesome. I know that will probably not happen, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm just a happy baby when I can, you know, record a song, write a song, you know, go in front of people and really, you know, rock my heart out and, you know, and like, you know, give them something they, you know, they can, you know, they can feel and, you know, so, and um, I I love animals. I'm, I'm a big, big, like, you know, like, yeah, I love animals. I, that's the only thing I miss, like, you know, like um, I was growing up with dogs and horses and, Two times in my life I had two parrots. Oh man, I love them so much. And um, so I would like to do something with animals. And uh, on the next record, I want to actually, there's a song in the making, like for a new album, and it's called Heavenly Creatures. That's the word title. And that's a song for the animals. And, you know, and I'm always cool. connected worldwide with people who are taking care of animals or, you know, um, trying to get them out of really bad situations and stuff. So, yeah. so yeah, that's like, yeah, I love people and I love animals so much. So, so yeah, doing, you know, doing more stuff. But, um, but one time I told one promoter in Florida, I told him that I'm really missing, like not having a dog or having an animal. And the promoter, he was pretty cool. And he said, ah, okay. So next day, we were playing in LA and um and then you know the receptionist said uh, somebody uh, sent you something and I said okay and the promoter from from Florida he sent out a cat a beautiful cat and I thought oh wow so I immediately fell in love with this cat and it was a little name tag you know baby and I thought oh so I love that cat and then of course it peed in every bunk in the tour bus. So the road crew and the band, you know, they were crazy. And my manager said, hey, you know, you got to send the cat back. And I said, no, no, it's my cat. You know, I love it. You know, it was instant love. And, you know, and then I went on stage and, you know, after the gig, the cat was gone. So the manager oh. sent it back to the promoter. And I was heartbroken. I didn't talk to that manager guy for weeks. But, you know, <laughs> but it was actually the last time that I had, like, you know, like, that yeah. uh, for, for a couple of days. But I understand it's like, you know, it's, it's not good for for the animal either. And, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah. But I was selfish for two days. And I let it sit in the tour bus. And, you know, and I was, you know... Uh, this illusion it would be great on tour but it's it's not and, yeah. it's cool to hear your soft spot for for animals um yeah, yeah that's yeah. really really cool Very soft, yeah. <laughs> well dory yeah. you've been uh so generous with your time i want to thank you for coming on and and uh, having this conversation um i think we're all just really uh, happy that you do what you do with such energy um and, and, you know, at such a high level for so long, it's really, um, it's inspiring. And so I want to thank you for this time. Thank you so much for being so kind to me and yeah, and for having me on your show. It was great. And I enjoyed it big time. And yeah, and I felt I could be myself, you know, like it or not. But you know, <laughs> that was a nice thing, you know, I felt different from from other interviews so it was i i had a lot of fun and yeah well, thank you well um we will um include some links so people can get to your your website and your schedules and your merchandise 
um, and we'll be watching for, uh, for, for the American tours. Of course, everybody will get to see this around the world, but um, we do have a lot of followers in the States. So we'll look forward to, yeah. at some point, some promoters bringing you over here to do some shows. Yeah, yeah, hopefully all the great festivals. I love playing yeah. festivals. Like, And yeah, yeah, definitely next year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe with even a new record. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that would be exciting. <laughs> really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. If this tour is not happening in the fall now, then I go right back into the studio and okay. work some more on a new album. If we do a tour, then, then yeah, I guess fall of next year we can expect a new album but uh, yeah, yeah we'll see we'll see okay. i'm flexible you know whatever yeah. will happen it will be good and yeah. yeah but see you very soon and yeah i love the states every single city and i was living in new york city for yeah 25 years and and then and then there were two hurricanes and oh my uh -huh, god yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I tell you, yeah, all kinds of things happen. And yeah, now I have a little place in New York and I have a little place in Florida. And of course, there are hurricanes as well. <laughs> I yeah. know. But uh, but I, I moved to uh, Long Island from Manhattan. I thought, ah, oh, it's safer there. And, you know, and, and then I got my apartment totaled two times, like the whole, it was a little house and I loved it. But right on the beach, it was great. But, you know, then I lost everything. Like, oh, my gosh. And, yeah. And my record collection. Oh, that no. Was the worst. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, everything else I didn't care, but, you know, photos and, you know, records and letters and, like, you know, I had so many photos and letters. For example, Ronnie James Dio, he wrote me a nice, you know, couple of letters and, like, oh, wow. while we were on tour together. And I said, oh, you know, and that, that's all somewhere in the ocean. And, you know, maybe oh. somebody found it, but, <laughs> yeah. But I know now how it is when you lose everything and you start all over again. So, yeah. So yeah, but uh, it's okay. It's okay. You know, as long as you're healthy, you know, everything is okay. You know. That's right. Yeah, you'll get more. You'll uh, get more things. Uh, I, I mean, it's a good thing you're not maybe in New York right now. They've just had a hurricane. I heard that. Uh, yeah, Ida, right? Yeah. Or another one. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's the one that's been ravaging New York. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, all my guys, they're from New York, and now they're here in Germany. They're all happy. It's like, yeah, man, yeah, it's terrible, man. Yeah, the whole world, it's like, wow, it's dangerous. Even to tour, you know, sometimes, you know, we go somewhere, and then it's like, wow, you know, you're happy when you survive a gig. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes we did open air uh, shows, and then, you know, it was like close to a tornado and stuff. And oh my God, it's like, yeah, in the 80s, 90s, I don't remember that uh, everything was always pretty smooth. Yeah. But uh, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, it's going to be <laughs> really interesting to see uh, how the live touring industry changes in the in the yeah. wake of covid because i know i've got i there's some tours going to start coming through seattle and i i purchased my tickets and then i've started to get um the emails saying that they require proof of vaccination and um I, i'm not i'm not a, a overly political person but i i know that people have different opinions about that and so i i just don't know how that's going to affect tour audiences so yep. it's just a yep. We just don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah. But I tell you what, you know, like, I know so many people who died, like, you know, like close, like friends or musicians. So, you know, it's that, that stuff is dangerous. Like some people said, oh, it's nothing. Oh, man, I tell you, you know, I, I know many people who didn't survive it. And yeah. you know, when we tour in the tour bus, uh, like always 20 people, like, oh, my God. You know, and, and the meets and greets and, you know, and the hugging and kissing and, you know, it's like, yeah. like Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to think about all yeah. that stuff now, um, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 Hopefully it will be, it will be good next year. And yeah. yeah. But I tell you, like, like these concerts with like social distancing. Oh, man. It's like, oh, yeah. that's hard work. It's hard work. And, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I still, I, I, I love doing it. It's sure. anything is better than doing nothing. And, and yeah, so, yeah, so I give it my all and I, you know, I try to make up little things which would compensate the distance. So, you know, that yeah. people still feel like, you know, right there and yeah, you know. 
Well, I, I have no doubt that whatever tour you bring will be great. I, I suspect by the time you get back to my neck of the woods, things will be relatively normal again. Because I know part of the mm -hmm. co concert experience is getting to rub shoulders with your fellow metalheads. That's, you know. Absolutely, you know. Yeah, like sweating and hugging and, you know, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But, yeah, yeah, let's hope for the best, yeah. That's yeah. right, that's right. All right, well, Dora, I'm going to play the outro. If you'll just stick on the line one second so I can say a personal mm -hmm. goodbye. Um, we'll okay. we'll sort of um, sign off to this episode with a lot of gratitude for um, your graciousness. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Oh man! All right, take good care. Sweet. <laughs> you too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>